world. Welcome back to our series, Yes, a Way to Learn. It is a pleasure for me to today welcome Donna Sarkar, who is running the Windows Insider program. I am Professor Sandra Ziver, head of the IS department. So, Donna, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. What and, an honor. And we're going to talk, as we do normally here mm -hmm. in, in our series, about, about the future of learning. Mm -hmm. How do we think uh, leaders learn? And as you know, mm -hmm. we have been inviting influential people mm -hmm. uh, um, to, to actually, actually talk, talk uh, to, to us, us about, about this. this. And, and so I would like, like to open just with a very quick question, meaning a um, little bit of your background, mm -hmm. you know, but then also very much is why are you actually interested in this topic of learning? How do you see it? How does it tie to you? Sure. Your background? Okay, well, my background is it's kind of boring. I studied computer science in undergrad in college, and then I started to work at a tech company called Siebel Systems, who did customer relationship management software. All that means is it keeps all customer information inside a database. And then that company got bought by Oracle, who most people in the world know. And I realized, you know, I'm kind of done being a database developer. I'd been doing that for about three years. But I didn't see normal people, people like, you know, lawyers and doctors and my parents actually using this product. And I really wanted to see the product that I spent so much time on be used in the real world. So I went to work at Microsoft, which is, of course, in Seattle, Washington, where I lived. And immediately I joined the Windows team. Now Windows is used by two billion people in the world. And I still had a very fond memory of going to my grandmother's house in Nepal, the side of a mountain. You walk into the house and in the kitchen, there's a Windows PC there. So it runs my grandmother's house in Nepal. It also runs Wall Street. So I couldn't think of a better way to have impact in the world than work on a product like Windows. And I worked on many different components of it, from opening and saving files, to start menu, to actually being able to roam your information from this machine to that machine. And now I run the Windows Insider program, which is a big community of people who are tremendous fans of Windows, but also want to have a hand in influencing the future direction of it. So we're 10 million plus people, and uh, I get petabytes and petabytes of feedback from these incredibly passionate users on what more they would like to see the operating system do to make a better product for not just us, but for their communities as well. Um, so th this was a little bit of, of, of your background. Yeah. But um, here our, our audience uh, doesn't know about it, but I, I do. And it's, it's, you're sort of a very versatile woman because you're not only into you know, what we would say mm -hmm. is a tech geek here. Right. You know, it's like I'm doing my Windows Insider program <laughs> and I have these millions of people that actually help me um, making Windows a better product. But you also are sort of into fashion and mm -hmm. you have like a sort of very, very broad background, mm -hmm. broad sense of um, many in different inter yeah. interests. How do you think that being such a polyphasetic person actually has influenced your overall learning process to become who you are today. I can't say enough about being an and, right? Because a lot of people when they're young, they have this idea that they want to do many things, right? They say, I want to be a politician and an artist and a writer and an astronaut. And I think adults actually kind of beat it out of us and say, you have to choose a profession, you have to go to school, study a thing, choose a profession and do it until you retire. And I think that's a very outdated way to look at things because we live a very long time. We live to be you know, 100 plus years old. And to do the same thing, a degree that you chose when you were 18 years old, is a very long time, right? Letting an 18 year old choose your career is not the best idea, right? Especially for the rest of your life. Because we think back to how smart we were at 18. I was not very smart at all. So one of the things that I realized was, I. I love software engineering. I love it so much. I think it's one of the most creative professions in the world because you see an idea and you solve that problem with nothing, right? Nothing exists and you put zeros and ones together to solve a problem. But there was another part of me that also loved to create with the words. So I took a creative writing course when I was very early in career and fell in love with this concept of just making stuff up. Right? And it didn't need to make sense, whereas computer programming kind of needs to make sense. All of these zeros and ones need to add up to something that has to run that becomes software. But fiction writing was very much subjective. It could be good, it could be bad. Right? You and I can read the same piece of fiction. You can say it's brilliant, I can say it's terrible. 
With computer software, it's not like that. It ran or it didn't. So I was looking for something that was a little more subjective, a little less black and white, zero or one. So I started writing fiction, and then I quickly realized, oh my gosh, it's so applicable to the software industry. Because a big part of software and making products, tech products, is being able to storytell its value to your stakeholders. Whether that's your upper management, your customers, or your partners, being able to paint a compelling picture of why this version of Windows is the thing you need in a compelling way, which is very different than going in and saying, here's the 18 features it has. No. But you say something like, this version of Windows will make it so no hacker can ever get into your system. Don't you want that? But that's storytelling. It's completely 100% storytelling. So it's, it's mixing the very, very yes. formal sort of exactly. abstract way of, yes. of doing programs no, together yeah. with the, the crea creativity. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, I was listening to you mm -hmm. and I was now thinking, it's like, okay, no, here we are at the business school. Mm -hmm. And the business school is yes. very much for formal learning process. That's right. No? Mm -hmm. And how would you see actually the combination of both? I mean, yes. huh? because you, you do a lot of discovery, mm -hmm. no? you do it, okay, let's see how can I actually complement this with the other. Yeah. No? But how do you see actually the role of formal learning yeah. no, to actually sort of help you advance? And where do you see, do you have good formal learning moments? How important is it actually, yeah. do you think? I find formal learning to be very important because I'm formally trained. I did computer science formally. I did creative writing formally. I went to fashion school also on the side formally. I didn't just sit at home and learn to figure it out. I could, but it's actually pretty lonely to try to figure out things on your own in your house. So I loved having that ability to have a formal learning institution where I'm learning from experts, but also learning alongside other people who also have no clue. So I didn't feel quite so dumb when I was trying to figure it out. But having so many mentors and such who've graduated from this institute before. So I'm a tremendous fan of formal learning. I think formal institutions should evolve a little bit to diversify their curriculum, right? One of the things that I tell everybody is computer science education should have a business element to it. Because so many computer scientists go off and say, oh, I'm going to start my own company. But they have no business sense whatsoever, in, me included. And one of the benefits of working at a company like Microsoft is we have 120,000 people, but 50,000 are, are engineers. So 70,000 people are not engineers. We need those 70,000 so badly <laughs> to be successful. So my partner in crime, Jeremiah Marble, is, has a business background. The two of us run the Windows Insider program together, but we need both of our skill sets. We need my deep history in Windows, but we need his analysis of, yes, our business is doing well, these are fixed costs, variable costs, things I don't understand because I never took business courses. So I think at a school like IESC, it really benefits to have business curriculum include some tech, have tech curriculum include some business, because first it fosters relationships outside of the normal, right? Let the business school folks understand computer science people. Let the computer science people understand business things. It builds a deep respect for that profession, and it lets you learn the language. So you're able to actually go and say, hey, I want to start a company. I need someone who understands finance versus accounting versus legal. These are not the same thing or letting business people say, I need a web designer compared to an operating system compared to Bitcoin, because these are not the same thing. So I think it's doing a little bit of a crossover mm -hmm. will be really, really helpful. I'm actually, I, w I was listening while you yeah. were talking, and, and this is always a, a discussion that we have here at the business school, yeah. um, which, is, which is how much tech should actually a business student know. That's right. No? And it's, yeah. I think it's one of, of, of these, not only for, for business schools, mm -hmm. but, but in general for, for companies. Mm -hmm. And we have many executives uh, now yes. listening to us. Is, is How much of tech knowledge do you actually think business people today should have? Because traditionally, we used to have very little tech knowledge That's because right. tech, knowledge, uh, te tech knowledge was for the technologists. Right. And, but with the digital thing mm -hmm. sort of coming into yeah. our, our uh, companies, we probably need to ramp up a little bit mm -hmm. that tech knowledge. So what would be your take? And I know that you come yeah. from a tech company, yeah. you know, but <laughs> so we should also sort yeah. of discount this a little bit. No, but I mean, you, you see not so many people, you mm -hmm. see so many business school. What's your right. current take on seeing how much tech knowledge should actually the non-technology guys have? Um, so you said it, right? It's digital transformation is here. Every single industry is transforming digitally. At this point, every company is a tech company. Every company has a website. Every company has customer data. 
Every company should be tracking their customer data. Every company has social media. And if they're not building and tracking this, they're not, they're not evolving to what they could be. So I believe that every single tech person should fully understand how to track and measure their customer engagement, right? How do they acquire customers? How do you track what those customers are doing? And what is that customer's feedback? So it's less about you need to learn to build websites or build an operating system or build cryptocurrency, but more about the most important thing a, a business has, which is its customers. How can we create the best possible experience for them? And I think that every single business school student should learn, well, a few things. One, basic HTML, right? That's just, you should be able to modify your website if something is incorrect, right? HTML is very, very straightforward. I can teach someone HTML in about 15 minutes, right? I've taught a room full of people HTML in 15 minutes. And it's, it's magical because you can go and change things and see those changes happen in real life. Second thing is information security, which I'm sure is very near and dear to you, because people have to learn to protect their data. And they have to understand the, the importance of a strong password, the importance of phishing. Don't click on that. Here's how to be safe in this world where we're being hacked every minute, right? And I think it's a thing where business leaders absolutely need to lead with how can we keep our information secure? And the third thing I do think is customer data. They have to be able to first reach customers through social media, measure the impact of that social media work, because many companies put ads out there, right? They'll put ads or hire influencers, but they won't measure the impact of what those influencers are doing. Which are the top influencers? Which posts by those influencers did the best? If they don't measure, they don't know. If you can't measure it, you can't improve it. Otherwise, you're just guessing. So I think technology makes it easier to drive efficiencies into a lot of these things that business people really need to know. So I think those three things are things every single business person in the world should learn. Would you change your answer a little bit if it was for the very senior executives? I wouldn't because they need to know to hire, right? Because mm -hmm. I feel that even if, um, say you're the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, I think it's vitally important that you set that tone and set that culture all the way down. And I've noticed that when CEOs are say, you know what, let me leave the tech out of this, they seem very old school. They seem to be like not as involved with the future of their business and their future of their digital transformation. But the CEO does not need to be the CTO. They don't need to understand the nitty gritty of how their supply chain works or how which customer relationship management tool they have. They need to know that they need one because they need to know to hire a CTO who has the competencies to do that. Mm -hmm. And following up on that, mm -hmm. I mean, and all our senior executives yeah. that we have here, we have quite some, quite some. Yeah, they all complain about the pace of change. Yes, and and how to learn about this. Yes, and and since you're coming from a tech company, I mean, you're yes. used to this increased pace yes. of change from the very beginning. This is how you now started. It's already at Siebel and That's then Oracle right. and then blah blah. blah. Yeah. I mean, we're used to this pace of change. Right, but. If you had to give an advice and say, mm -hmm. hey, learn from uh, our experience now that tech is getting yeah. pervasive and is going to be for everybody. That's right. Uh, how would you try to help them to actually keep track with the changes without getting overwhelmed. crazy and overwhelmed? That's right. I mean, so, so it's like the three things to do and with that you can go and sleep yeah. well at night. <laughs> yeah. Um, the example I'll give you is the publishing industry, which I know very, very well. Um, when I first started writing in 2000s, it was publishing houses all day. And there was a series of gatekeepers. So first, an author like myself would write a manuscript, and then we would submit that manuscript to an agent. And first, getting an agent was a lot of work. Out of, um, I queried 80 agents, one responded back. So one out of 80, not so good. Then it took me five years to sell a manuscript, for my agent to sell a manuscript to a publishing house. So we, I think I've been rejected 450 times or something, crazy number like that. So for me to become a published author the first time took me five years and six manuscripts. That's a lot of gatekeepers. And they are not speaking on behalf of the audience. 
right? The, they don't know if that the audience that I'm trying to reach, which are young adults, will resonate with my writing or not because they're putting it to the lens of gatekeepers, such as an agent and editor. Now, what happened was Amazon came along and said, mm, let me remove the gatekeepers. And suddenly anyone can be an author on Kindle or on now Amazon Create Space. And the public decides, right? They decide what is a bestseller. So Amazon didn't get rid of publishing. It transformed publishing to remove the gatekeepers, remove the complexity with which to produce and consume. So the thing I would tell um, the leaders of large companies is, the pace of change is hard, I completely understand. Security is vitally important, you can't mess around with it because if your customer data is available and vulnerable, everyone loses faith in your business, right? We see it with Equifax, we see it over and over and over again. 100% protect your customer's data, otherwise you won't have customers. The second one is let your customers engage. So the example I'll give is publishing houses did not let readers produce and consume easily. Amazon does. I'm a voracious reader. I, bu I buy books all the time. I also write. I'm both a producer and a consumer of Amazon's publishing platform. Airbnb is the same. Producer and consumer. I can rent a home. I can put my home for rent. Airbnb doesn't own any hotels. Uber doesn't own any taxis. They're letting their customers do the work. So I tell people, let your customers do the work they probably want to be involved, right? We call this model co-creating. Co-create your business with your customers. Find out what they're trying to do, and then really give them the ability to make that change. I think it is the most modern way of product development, and I cannot wait to see big companies try to understand what that means. And if you are a slightly smaller company, mm -hmm. No, because uh, you can normally say, okay, mm -hmm. the big ones are sort of at the forefront of That's everything right. and they will yeah. catch the trend easy yes. and okay, we, we filter it out, we yeah. do it from the customers or either, e even from our providers, no? but That's we go right. for co-creation, That's right. will happen. But now, if you're a small or, or a medium enterprise, and you're sort of in the middle, you're not going to be have like the most sort of pioneering customers That's there right. and you still have the feeling and the need That's that right. you will have to evolve your business model. Right. That it may be disruptive, that right. there may be something coming, right. um, but you don't have the option of those customers. What would you then right. do? Well, I would actually reach to the customers I do have and have a very good conversation, right? And say, you are our most prized customers. You were our first customers, because everyone knows, right? Who are the most prized customers? And figure out what is it that those customers' goals are for the next two, three, four years, and how can the company provide more to make those goals happen? So the thing I tell people now is back in the 90s, the transaction, so you provide a service or product, I give you money, that transaction was the end of the relationship, right? We built a relationship, that transaction happened, I now go away, use this product, you walk away with the money, we may never talk to each other again. That era is over. It does not work that way. Now the transaction is the beginning of the relationship. I'm saying I've bought a service from you and I expect that you're going to keep that service up to date. I expect that you are now invested in my business as a mentor. So I expect a company to continue to provide services to make my business better. And that's just going to be the way the, the modern world evolves. Because if companies are not doing that, there's always going to be a startup who's willing to do it, right? It's the ongoing relationship. And companies who figured out their repeat customers are the best customers, they're the ones who continue to win over and over. Because if your customer is not successful using your product, they're not going to use it again, but they're also not going to recommend it. And this is a very, very old principle exactly. that we have of customer exactly. retention, right? Yes. So actually back to the, back to the basics. But yeah. there's something no, I, in all your speech and everything mm -hmm. that you're saying that I think is very, very different. It has to do with creativity. Mm -hmm. no? Because yeah. at the end, it's like know the customer, know what they yes. want to, know what they will need. Yes. No? And, and it sort of gets into this sort of very you know, high creativity. Startup comes, it's going to That's be right. creative by definition. Otherwise, right. they're not going to exist. And, and very often when you are an executive, an yes. executive is executing something. Yes. So it's not a creative who is mm -hmm. just creating something. That's right. How can we get executives actually to learn 
uh, about creativity. You know, very often they just say, look, I mean, I'm not the creative person. That's Otherwise, right. I would we have be a, a creative, creative person. Yeah. You know, we have a creative mm -hmm. person. But when you're saying, hey, we need everybody to get into this, to understand the changes, right. and that, it's not just understanding the changes, right. it's talking about them, That's understanding right. them, and then creating something right. with those changes. And, and probably the CEO should become the first change agent, if Absolutely. I understand you well. So, so how do we sort of take away a little bit the, the fear of creativity? Um, so back in the day, when we were all young, when we got a blank sheet of paper, we were excited because it's open. You can make a paper airplane out of it. You can turn it into a crown to wear on your head. You can draw on it. The possibilities are endless. We were never afraid of a blank sheet of paper. But as we grew up, people started to critique that work. So we became afraid of a blank sheet of paper. And then we went to the other side of the sheet of paper and became the critique of the work. Right? We let someone else come up with the vision, and then we had opinions on that topic. And now most of the professions in the world are upholding or crit criticizing. They're not creating. But entrepreneurship is the ultimate creativity because you're making a business from scratch. You're looking at a blank sheet of paper and saying, what will this business be? How will we make money? Which customers are we serving? How are we going to reach out to them? How are we going to test with them? So it is the most creative profession of all, by far. And every creative, like artists, painters, writers, they're all entrepreneurs because they have to make money somehow. Right? So they've got to hustle and they've got to make money. So they're all entrepreneurs, every single last one of them. And I think for executives, it's to find that inner creative that exists because it existed once. But um, just from a tactical point of view, I think it's incredibly important for them to engage with not business people. To go and hire or you know, have offsites with people from design school or people from art school and tell them a problem that they're having and be open to the interpretation, right? Like an uh, exec may say, I'm having a really hard time figuring out how to hire from not our top 10 universities, but hire differently. How do I do that? So they should go to a design school and ask this question. And all of these people will have very different ideas on how to hire. Some might say, um, go on a cruise and hire from there, right? Uh, one of the most interesting people we have at Microsoft, he used to be the main demo person was someone who was a cruise singer on a ship. He had stage presence like no one's business because that was his business, right? But he was one of the best product demoers because he knew how to work a room so incredibly well. So I think it's really getting out of like execs talking to execs and go into a place where they do engage with the kind of behavior they would like to emulate. The other thing I think it's extremely important for execs and senior leaders is to have deep thinking time. And I don't think they block out time to do this, where everyone's, you know, like you said, execution, execution, execution. And exec's main job is to unblock people, right? Like, oh, I need this approved, or this office space, or this or that, this problem. And they're always solving immediate problems, but they never get deep thinking time. And you will never get deep thinking time in the office, because people are always going to come knock on your door. So for me, I block it out. I have um, two afternoons a week that I am out the door at one, and I go and hide in a secret location in Seattle, and I have deep thinking time, where I'll write a problem to myself, and I say, how can we do this with the team? And I get away, and I journal, I write, I draw alone, and I solve the problem every single time. This thing of deep thinking mm -hmm. is actually something that we're listening very recurrently yeah. whenever we talk to people that do digital mm -hmm. transformation. Mm -hmm. And we actually, we're here at the school, we're yeah. using a, a German term, because I'm yeah. German, <laughs> called Wanderlust. And okay. Wanderlust is just yes. this thing of hanging around and yes. just I walk and yes. uh, let your ideas sort yes. of just be walking around in your brain. That's right. No, until at some point, no, it's like the students that do a sabbatical, yes. a sabbatical for a year That's so that right. they learn mm -hmm. uh, for during a year what do I yes. want to do with my life. And That's after right. a year, supposedly, yes. you know, if it's a German process, so it's That's supposedly right. <laughs> they come up with the idea of what they want yeah. to have. And this is a sort of this this sort of creativity. But when I was listening to you, I was still thinking this is so against sort of structures and hierarchies, mm -hmm. right? Because because at the end, what we're saying is that if you really want to get this creative time, I mean, you need to go against your incentives. You yes. need to be willing to not be right. 
That's right. And you need to be wrong. Yes. Um, because you were saying you need to first start saying I have this problem. That's right. Uh, and that is already uh, very often some some mm -hmm. very hard thing to do. So how do we break the structures and those boundaries to actually allow me not only to get creative at an individual level, mm -hmm. but take it to an organizational level? So I'm Mic sure that you have done a number of things oh, at gosh. Microsoft to break certain of those. So can yeah. you just give us a glimpse? And we have culture at Microsoft that Satya really, Satya Nadella, our new CEO, mm. not new, three years now, um, he brought called Growth Mindset, which is all about, we never want to say, I know how to do this. We want to say, I don't know how to do this, but I will learn how to do this. Just because we don't know how to do something does not mean we can't do it. Because if that was the case, all of us would be in a fetal position crying, because that's the only thing we really know how to do. But everything else, talking, walking, riding a bicycle, making our way to a job every day, is learned behavior. So we as adults have to realize that we're not done learning. We're never done learning. The day you stop learning, you stop growing. There's no way you're going to grow without learning. So if you don't want your business to stagnate, you have to have that growth mindset of, we have to keep learning. And the way to learn is by doing. And a big part of doing is failing. The first time you play the piano, you're terrible. The first time you ride a bicycle, you fall off and skin your knees. The first time you read, you can't pronounce island. This is normal, right? We're bad at it. We're naturally bad at everything. Then we become less bad, less bad. Suddenly we're good. But it's a progression. And at Microsoft, we really celebrate failures. Um, it's one of my favorite things about the company. We do, um, we have this model on my team where we have 100 ideas in, a, in one year. We'll have 100 ideas. We'll run 25 experiments to prove, uh, see if which of those have actual promise. And then five successes will emerge. And that's been the case for two years now. So we've noticed that. Out of the 100 ideas, five successes. But if we hadn't done those 100 ideas, we wouldn't have had those five successes. We would still be doing exactly what we did the previous year. And you, and you think that this process that you're describing mm -hmm. is sort of part of corporate learning at Microsoft? Mm -hmm. Or do you yeah. have late, so this is like the biggest sort of change that you've seen? Or is there a, other things that you I think that that's also this relevant? Being safe to fail. It's incredibly important, right? Mm -hmm. To say, I want to make this company better. I want to serve our customers better. And here's the thing I tried. And it didn't work, and here's what I learned from it, and what I'll do differently next time. It is one of the biggest changes I've seen in the last three years that makes me want to stay there for a very, very, very long time. Because it's so important for us to realize that we are not the same company we have been for 30 years. We have to evolve. And a big part of that evolution is changing how we do business. We can't just make products ship them in boxes. It doesn't work anymore, right? The world has changed and evolved. So the way we make products has to change and evolve. And we can say it just by our offerings. Before, we used to sell Windows in office in boxes you buy in a store. Now you go to you know, windows.com and click install. Um, so the way we've sold these products are now different. And I, I believe that in the future, how we make them will be different as well. Just how we make Windows completely different than it has been in the past. Um, and how they're making Office is also changing. So those showed a lot of growth mindset because we failed a lot. It's not like we, didn't, we did this right the first time. No. It took many iterations, many tries to get to a point where we feel good about this. Now we have a good base. So all of the changes we make on top of it we're going to go through that learning curve of failing, failing, less failing, less failing, being good. And, and at the end, I mean, and, and we mm -hmm. uh, are sort of reaching the end of, of mm -hmm. the interview here, which I think has been extremely interesting. But at the end, I mean, it's, it's always this combination between thinking and acting, Yes, I believe. No? And yes. I, I know that your new book is going to be mm -hmm. Do the Thing. Do the Thing. No? So, and, and without getting into the book, which yeah. so that's the thing. I, I would like to, I mean, everybody who is, who is watching us today or is going to watch the video um, afterwards, I, I do think that if you ever have a problem of not knowing how to go into your creativity, I think that you should join the do the think movement that mm -hmm. Donna has sort of started, right? And uh, if you just would like to very briefly 
no? yeah. in the last sort of minute yeah. that we have. Explain us a little bit because I found it very, very intriguing. Mm -hmm. no? I mean, how do we get to do the thing? So everyone has this idea in their head that they've always wanted to try, but they're held back by it for whatever reason. I don't have time. It's not the right time in my life. I'm very busy. What will people say? I'm not qualified. And we have all these voices in our head that are really uh, addition of all of the voices we've heard that have doubted us and it's there in the back of our head and that voice is what keeps us in the comfort zone and doing exactly what we did yesterday over and over but that's not the way to grow and that's not the way to learn and eventually you will grow deeply unhappy because we as humans we're designed to learn we're designed to learn this is why we make ai the machine learns because we learn it's we have this ongoing desire like that's why makeover shows are so popular before or after we love to see makeovers and transformations so we each have this transformation we want to see within ourselves but often we're even too admit afraid to admit it out loud right i've heard people say i want to be the ceo of microsoft i'm like great go do that they're like you don't think that's crazy i said do you think satya did not want to be the ceo of microsoft no he said i want to be the ceo of microsoft let me take the 10 steps to make it happen Right? Things don't happen to people like that. They go and happen to things. So do the thing is um, a four step process written from a fiction writer's point of view. You create a fictional version of yourself and you lead them through this hero's journey concept until they overcome the villain, which is the voice within, and they do the thing. Okay, mm -hmm. so world, here we are. I hope that you all want to do the thing and if you need some inspiration, you now know, I mean, Donna <laughs> exists. She has the two books, Hello World and Do the Things and then just a number of other <laughs> things. So if you're interested, just Google her up, find her on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. And it has been a pleasure for us to having you here. Thank you. On campus today for these webinars on um, A Way to Learn by Yese. And we hope to see you all back soon when we have the next version of our webinar. I wish you all a wonderful afternoon or day and say bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Donna.